All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, whatever time it is. I don't know. Uh, we are on to day four of our different types of uh, free response questions. Uh, we're still trying to stick to two today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about two particular types, and that is area and volume and differential equations. Uh, look at an example of each and just stuff to keep in mind with those. I was going to do um, an area and volume problem with polar, but I've decided against it just because it's not being tested, and, um, and I'm trying to keep the videos as short as possible for you all so you don't get overwhelmed. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into just like a regular like area and volume problem that practices all the different types we learned and uh, something I would expect maybe to be on the final exam because it was a, a, big, a big unit for us, um, especially if they're not going to do polar area. I was I would expect them to do at least this kind of area. So this was a big, big chunk of AB for us. So it says let R be the. Uh, sh this is first of all this is question two, two from two thousand, um, and it is AB number one and you see BC number one. Okay. So let R be the um, shaded region in the first quadrant, uh, enclosed by the graphs of. Y equals um, e to the negative x squared, and y equals 1 minus cosine x, and the y-axis as shown in the figure above. So we see the shaded region right there, and it's clearly labeled each of the functions for us, so that works out good as well. Um, and this is question number one, so this is calc active. Okay. Um, and I like this question because all parts are practicing the three main things we did with, with um, these types of functions. So A says find the area of the region R. Okay, area is not too bad at all. That'll always be a part A question. And all you have to do is the area at the top, subtract the area at the bottom. Or right minus left, but this is clearly going to be a top function, subtract a bottom function. Okay, so we're going to do the integration from 0 is where it starts at the left. Now the right side right here, okay, I don't, it doesn't tell me what the intersection is. It looks like it's one, but it's not. Um, what you need to do, since this is calc active, is set the two equations equal to each other. So you need to do e to the negative x squared equals one minus cosine of x, okay? And just again, find that intersection in the calculator. Um, if you're going to if you're going to find that intersection in the calculator and you're going to plug it into the integral, don't round it to three decimals. Write down the entire thing. Um, and for sake of space, and a lot of times what the answer key does is they'll just denote that as a variable. So that intersection, I'm going to say, is A equals, and what I found it to be was, where's it at? There it is, point, or zero point nine one, nope, point nine, uh, Four one nine four four, and you can check that math if you want. Yesterday's video, I messed up one little piece, um, and which was in the comments of the YouTube section. But um, so check my math. I guess is a good point. So we're going to say zero to a is that intersection. The top equation, which is e to the negative x squared minus the bottom equation, which is one minus cosine of x dx and that's your setup so just plug that in the calculator um, and what I ended up getting that area to be was 0 0.5909624501 and you can um, and you can honestly just you can do that at three decimal places if you want okay all right B. B is another good problem. Now we're talking about volume. The volume when we're generating this region uh, about the x-axis, which is right here. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this region and going around that line of revolution. Now, whenever you're doing uh, lines of revolution, you always got to ask yourself, is there going to be a gap in it or not? And in this case, you can clearly see that like, like this little space right here is going to be a gap. So if that's the case, we have to do washer method. So we're going to have to take like the, the volume generated by the outer function and then subtract the volume created by the inner function. Um, or how we put it is we said radius squared of the bigger one minus radius squared of the smaller one. So how it looks. Um, volume equals, remember it's, we're using basically the cross-section pi r squared for a circle. So we take the pi out 
and it's going to be the integral from the same um, the same integral as before, like 0 to a, the same bounds, because it's still the same function. And we're going to do the outer radius squared, so that's going to be e to the negative x squared squared, subtract um, the volume from the smaller one, so that's going to be 1 minus cosine of x quantity squared. Okay. Um, and if you type out that whole thing with the pi included, uh, you get 1.7466, uh, 1.409, and again, you do it at three decimal places, that's fine. Okay. And then lastly, in part C here, it says the region, okay, so we did area check, we did volume check, now we're going to talk about cross sections. It says that the region R is the base of a solid, which it usually is, and it says for this solid, each cross section perpendicular to the x-axis, which if I drew that on my graph here, looks like this. It's cross sections are perpendicular to the x-axis, so that's top minus bottom. Top minus bottom. And um, the cross sections are square, so if I cut this this three-dimensional uh, object down the middle here, these cross-sections are square, and I want you to find the volume of the solid. So remember for cross-section, it's going to be the integral from, in this case, 0 to a again, and it's going to be of a of x. Remember a of x was our, um, our, our area formula for those cross-sections, right? And so we just have to figure out what a of x is in, in terms of x. So the area is in a square, so remember that uh, our area is equal to so square, which is base times height, or base squared, because base and height are the same. Now, in terms of a to the x, that's going to be a of x. Now, how am I going to write that base squared in terms of x? Well, it's the base is just the length from the top function to the bottom function, kind of what I drew right here, right? Because remember, squares are coming out of there. And those, uh, those bases are going to be the distance from the top function minus the bottom function. So this is really going to be e to the negative x squared minus 1 minus cosine of x quantity squared. Okay, so there's our, there's our base squared. So I'm going to do uh, the integral uh, 0 to a of e to the negative x squared minus 1 minus cosine of x quantity squared. And whenever I did that, I got 0.4. Ugh, that's ugly. I got 0 0.46106351107 um, as my final answer. So there you have it. We did one of each, and I thought that was a good problem to practice everything and uh, setting it up and memorizing the formulas there. Uh, here's just the answer key to it. Uh, looks like we got all the parts, I believe. So we got the correct limits uh, for part. Well, before we even got to part A, it was that we got the correct limits for the integration. So we got this as our intersection. Um, so that worked out. And um, in part A, we set up the correct integrand, and we got the answer to be 0.591, so that's good. Uh, in B, we got the correct integrand um, and constant, so uh, basically we did a pi right there, and we set this part up correctly, and we did get the correct answer. Um, and finally, the last one, uh, well, that we just set up the integral correct again, um, and then we got the answer. So. Pretty straightforward stuff there. Um, okay, just a little summary here, um, all the stuff we kind of talked about already. Um, just stuff you need to know how to do. So make sure you know how to find the intersections like we did in that problem to figure out our uh, limits of integration. Um, know how to find the area between two curves. Um, so we just did that. Know how to find the volume, okay, when it's using disk or washer method, which we talked about that. Uh, know how to do the volume with cross sections, so that's good. Um, and then it says, oh, okay, so I like this one right here. We, this was the only thing we really didn't really talk about. It says find the equation 
of a vertical line that divides the region in half, area or volume, that involves setting up and solving an integral equation with the limit. All right, so what that's talking about, like if we go back to that previous problem, okay, it looked like this, okay. So what we did is we actually found the area in part A. The area in part A was, um, what was the area in part A, like 0.591? Yeah, so the area of the whole thing was equal to 0.591. Sometimes it'll ask you to find a line that cuts it in half, cuts the area in half, and it wants you to know what that bound is. It wants you to know what, like, we'll call it, well, I've already used A. We'll call it um, K, some K value that cuts it in half. Well, that's a pretty simple setup, and we've done this a bunch of times. All you have to do is do like the integral zero where we start to k um, of my function, which was top e to the negative x squared minus bottom, which was 1 minus cosine of x. Okay, so there's top minus bottom. And I know that that's going to be equal to half the area I found in a. And then you can set up that integration and solve for k. This is not a problem you do that with because that's a hard integration. Um, if, if you do have to solve it by hand, it'll be an easy integration, but in this particular problem, they would probably just ask you to set it up, which there's the setup right there. Okay. So there you have it. I was going to do another one with polar, but I don't, we don't need to do that. Okay. So there's some other problems you can practice, uh, doing areas and stuff like that. Um, just making a little note here, like here's one with polar, if you really want to try that. Um... That's really about it. I've seen it with polars on there. Here's one with cross section. That's a good one. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, let's move on. All right, so that's the first half. Now, the second half is going to be dealing with uh, differential equations. All right, I thought this was a good one. It has some good problems. So we'll just kind of go forward with this. Okay. Differential equations, so it says consider the differential equation dy over dx equals 2x minus y. Slope fields is a common question they do for part A for differential equations. So let's make sure we're, uh, we're set on that. On the axis provided, sketch a slope field for the given dots um, at the 12 points. So, and then sketch a curve that goes to the point 0, 1, which 0, 1 is right there. Okay. So for this particular example, like my work, I like to show a chart. So I always put like my x, y's right here, um, and then the slope at that point. So nothing too terrible. So like I can start at the point, I don't know, about negative 1, comma 2 there at the top left. Okay. If I plug that into my differential equation, 2x minus y, you get negative 4, which is a really steep slope. Ah, I'm trembling here. Something like that. Um, and I'm not going to do the whole chart for sake of time, but you can fill out all these entries and get the answers that you want. And I'll show you what the, uh, the solution I got was. So like it was negative four, then it goes like negative, that's negative three right there. Um, I got negative two, zero. I'm just filling out the rest for you. I got another zero slope right here at one, two. That's zero, and this is zero. Those are the two zero slopes I got. Um, steep, not as steep. Steep, not as steep, not as steep. So there you have it. There's our um, slope field. Now, if I want to draw a slope field that's going through one, we just follow the, uh, the slope starting off at zero, one. So it looks like if I start here kind of curve up this way as I go this direction I almost curve up that way so it almost looks like it's going to be a um, almost looks like it's going to be a quadratic equation like this is the slope field for a quadratic equation okay so there's your answer for a um, let's do part b so part b says the solution curve that passes through the point zero once which I kind of sketched up there has a local minimum at x equals ln of three uh, over 2. What is the y coordinate of this local minimum? Okay, so let's say if I plugged in ln of 3 halves, at, at, at that point I have a local minimum. Well, what do I know happens at local minimums? At local minimums, I know my derivative y over dx is going to be equal to 0. So we're going to use that knowledge 
and the fact that when my derivative is equal to zero, I know that x is equal to ln of three halves. So I'm going to use the fact that, uh, that 2x minus y equals zero, or 2ln of three halves minus y equals zero. So there you go. So simply put, if I solve for y, y is equal to 2ln of three halves. Easy enough. That question is just testing your knowledge that you know that, hey, the derivative is the same thing as that differential equation, and I know that a minimum makes us have a, a value of zero in that. So there you go. Okay. All right, let's move on to C. Okay. <clears throat> so C says, um, let y equal f of x be the particular solution to the given differential equation with the initial condition f of zero is one. Okay, so I got f of x is the particular solution, and I know that f of 0 equals 1. That's, that's a give me, kind of what I sketched up here. I knew that was my given point. Use Euler's methods. This is a good practice of Euler's methods, starting at x equals 0 with two step size of equal size to approximate negative 0.4 and show the work that leads to your answer. Okay, remember Euler's method. It's an approximation where you're stepping from one value, one x value, to the next. Remember, if we're given y sub n, we're looking for the next term, y sub n plus 1. And if you remember Euler's formula, all he says to do is to do the derivative, so dy over dx, at the previous point. So we'll call that x n, y n. So that's your derivative at the previous point. And we want to multiply that by our change in x. We call that delta x, or our step. And then add the previous y value. So I recommend knowing that, memorizing that, because if you're given a differential equation, chances are you'll have Euler's method. Okay? All right. Um, so now we just got to fill in these points using, I always set it up as a chart. I like to do it as a chart, kind of like this. Okay? So we're starting off at the point 0, 1. Okay? That's the initial point that it told us that we're starting off of. And it says two steps of equal size until we get to negative 0.4. Well, if that's the case, to get to that means I got two steps or two points before I get to negative 0.4. And the step size would then have to be negative 0.2 because then it would be negative 0.2 and negative 0.4. So I got my delta x. I know that I'm changing by negative 0.2 each time if I'm trying to estimate some point. I'm trying to estimate the point like right here on the curve, kind of halfway between 0 and negative 1. Okay. All right. So, uh, and then right here, I'm trying to figure out my next point starting at, I'm trying to figure out what y sub n plus 1 is equal to, what the next value is if I'm starting off at 0. I know the next x value is negative 0.2, but we're going to plug in some, some values here. Okay. So y sub n, so uh, it's going to be the derivative at 0, 1. So I know how to find that. That's 2 times 0 minus 1, which is just negative 1, I believe. Right? Yeah. Times my change in x, which is negative 0.2, negative 0.2, and then plus my previous y value, which is 1. Okay. This equals... Uh, 1.2. So we estimated that the next point is 1.2, and we're going to use that estimation to estimate the point at negative 0.4. So I'll say, how about y n plus 2, or just or the next term, whatever, however you want to rephrase it. More so the work's the important part. It's going to be 2 times my, uh, and again, I'm getting this from my differential equation at the beginning. 2 times, instead of 0, it's negative 0.2 minus 1.2, my y value. So that's my derivative of the previous point, times my change in x, which is still negative 0.2, and plus my previous y value, 1.2. And I got that that value is equal to 1.52. So there's my approximation of negative 0.4. Four, um, I'm approximating it as around 1.52. Okay, cool. So let's part C. And then D says, D says, 
find the second derivative in terms of x and y, and determine whether the approximation found in part c is going to be less than or greater than the actual value for negative 0.4 and explain your reasoning. I'm going to assume that my explanation of that fact is going to be using the second derivative. So let's keep that in mind. All right, so my second derivative is going to be the derivative of my first derivative. So the derivative of 2x minus y is going to be 2 minus dy over dx. That's my second derivative. Uh, it's just implicit differentiation. But then I got to plug back in whatever dy over dx is, which is 2x minus y. So d2y over dx squared is equal to 2 minus and then the derivative, which was 2x and then plus y if I distribute the negative through. Okay. okay. So now it wants me to approx it wants me to say, all right, here at the point, I'm at negative 0.4, negative 0.4, comma, 1.52, which is this point right here. Okay. It wants me to say, all right, that point that you that you identified right there using your, your step function. Okay, come and say. Okay. It wants to know, is that point going to be uh, um, an over approximation or an under approximation and we can even see that point is kind of right here okay well you can already tell if I'm talking about second derivative we should discuss it in terms of concavity you can already tell that it's concave up there all right the reason is is in this in this quadrant X is going to be greater than I'm sorry I said that backwards x is going to be less than 0, and y is going to be greater than 0. And if I plug negative value in for x into the second derivative and a positive value in for y in the second derivative, all right, in the second quadrant, no matter what, a negative is going to make this positive, and a positive is going to make this positive, no matter what, as long as x is less than 0 and y is greater than 0. So if I'm in the second quadrant, the second derivative is always going to be greater than zero in the second quadrant, okay? Meaning that my function is going to be concave up, which I can already tell from my sketch right here. So I know that this is what's going on right here, okay? And I can, again, I see that in my sketch, okay? So that means that if I were to use my Euler's approximation right here, what do we talk about if it's concave up and I'm trying to approximate a point where it's concave up? <coughs> Excuse me we're using um, tangent lines. Well, that means that this value right here, you can even see the tangent line is an under approximation of what the actual value is. So we would say that the value we found in part C, which was 1.52, is less than the actual value of f of negative 0.4. It's an under approximation. So um, I would really expect you to have A, B, and C. Those are the ones that 100%. D is always just hit or miss. Like they can ask you really anything. In this case, it was talking about the approximation uh, using the second derivative. So I think that's a good explanation to understand. But uh, I mean, it could be anything for part D. All right. So um, here's our answer key here. You can see this is pretty similar to what we got for our slope field and our um, sketch. Um, in part B, we set the derivative equal to zero, which is good, and we just solve for y, so we did that. Um, Euler's approximation using two steps. We did the correct two steps. We did f of negative 0.2 and f of negative uh, 0.4 using Euler's approximation, and we got the answer to be 1.52. We found the correct second derivative, and then our answer was the discussion we talked about. Uh, quadrant two, always making the second derivative positive, and therefore, based off of concavity, uh, that would be an under approximation. Okay. So there you have it. There's our um, there's our explanation for today. And just a little summary here: um, being able to find the general solution or the particular solution. That's the one thing we didn't really do here. We did Euler's approximation. We didn't talk about actually finding a particular solution. Just remember that how the steps are for finding the particular solution, like let's say that the derivative is equal to x, y. Remember how we found that particular solution is a separation of variables. So we had to like, 
we had the product of two variables together. How we separated it was we like separated the dy and the dx. So we would have like dy times one over y is equal to um, x times dx. And we would integrate each piece. So this would be ln absolute value of y. And this would be equal to one half x squared plus c. Okay. So there's your general solution um, doing separation of variables. We would typically try to solve for y if we could. In this case, we can. We could actually say that it would be um, uh, a e to the one half x squared power is equal to y. Because remember, we did e raised to the power of this side, and e to the c power comes down as an a. So there's your there's your uh, general solution. Uh, without having um, an initial point, okay? So you can refresh yourselves on that a lot. I mean, th th that's a typical extra thing I can see with differential equations. Um, we had applications with that, like growth and decay problems, okay? So I'd, I would probably know that. Um, uh, draw a slope field, which we just did, and sketch, we did that. Interpret a slope field, we didn't really do much with that, but um, I would definitely know Euler's method, 100%. Uh, method of partial fractions um, uh, for separating the variables. So just know how to separate your variables like we did right here. Okay. Um, and I would still know logistics model um, and, and, and your growth and decay problems. So just know how to set those up. And honestly, guys, they're going to give you the logistics model. I, I don't think you need to memorize that. They're going to give you that problem on the AP exam. Okay. All right, and here's some problems for you to try, and um, you can try as many as little as those as you want. Just mess around. You got the comments here. If you want to try a particular type of problem, you can. Um, and there you have it. Okay. Um, and that's it. So I kept my video under 30 minutes for as well today. So that was my goal. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I am basically ah, uh, done. So, yeah. Try the pra practice problems under day four, and we will be good to go. Good job, guys.